Hey Stone Point family, Kelly and I and our family are on vacation. While we miss you guys, I am so excited for you to hear from my friend Cody King. Cody has been a member at Stone Point for over four years. He's been a part of our band, volunteers in our student ministry, is a journey group leader, and is also a part of our sermon planning team. We gave him a challenge of doing Hebrews chapter 7, by far the hardest uh, chapter in all of the book of Hebrews, and I know he's going to nail it today. So get your Bible, make some notes, have some excitement, and follow along with him as he brings the message today. We love you, and we cannot wait to see you. Good morning, Stonewall Church. I am Cody King, and um, I kind of feel like a big deal now. Um, that the lead pastor on vacation makes a video introduction. Um, but I am Cody King. Um, I'm a German group, journey group leader. If you've seen me here, I'm on the worship team. And many other things, I try to just fill spots that need filled uh, as best that I can as the Lord would use me. But I'm excited to be here today. I'm glad that everyone is here. Um, and we are in week seven of our summer series over Hebrews, the first and the last. And if this is your first time joining us, we've been week by week going through the book of Hebrews and taking it chapter by chapter. So this is week seven, so we're in chapter seven. And it is a very difficult chapter. It is the focal point of the book of Hebrews. And before we dive into that, if you've been with us, you've seen in chapter five a man introduced to us. And then in chapter six, he was mentioned again. Now chapter seven, if you read ahead, you see the writer here really digs into who this guy was. And a lot of us can't even pronounce his name. So to help y'all out with that, we have a video. So y'all check this out real quick. And I just want you to look at it and then say it, okay? I don't know. Melchizedek. Melchizedek. What is that? Melchizedek. This is a joke, right? Melchizedek. 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 Jesus. 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 What? Jesus. Okay. Jesus. <laughs> so, who are we talking about today? Jesus. Jesus. Right. Whoever said Melchizedek, you lost. You can go home. I'm just kidding. <laughs> kidding. But Melchizedek. And yes, we are talking about Melchizedek, but more importantly, we're talking about Jesus. And the writer here is going to use the story of Melchizedek to point to the better Jesus. And if you've been with us, the writer of Hebrews, he's writing to Jewish believers in the first century who were struggling with who Jesus was, who the person of Jesus was. And what he does, as we've seen, he has shown that Jesus is better than Moses. He's better than the prophets of old. He's better than angels. He's better than Joshua. And here he's going to do the same. He's going to show that Jesus is better. So now if I were to ask you, who is the greatest Texas Rangers pitcher of all time? Ryan. Nolan Ryan, right. If, if I were to ask you who's the greatest Dallas Cowboys, we'll say running back, because if we say quarterback, it's going to start an argument, and we're all going to leave. <laughs> so who's the greatest Dallas Cowboys running back of all time? Smith. Emmitt Smith, right. So who's the ba greatest batter of all time? Babe Ruth, right. Muhammad Ali, greatest boxer. We all either culturally or individually have an idea of who the greatest something is, greatest guitar player, greatest band, greatest basketball player. We have a greatest in mind when we're asked that question. If you were to ask a first century Jew, or even Jew today, who's the greatest Hebrew, the answer that you're going to get is Abraham. You might get a King David, but you're going to get Abraham 99.9% .9 of the time because Abraham is their patriarch. He's the father of the entire nation. There's no one above Abraham. So the writer here at the beginning of chapter 7, he's going to, in a way, he's going to say, okay, I see your Abraham, but I raise you a Melchizedek. All right? So we, saw, we first saw him in chapter 5, and then, again at the after, and, and then again at the end of chapter 6. But then in chapter 7, he really goes into depth. But it's interesting how the writer writes this, in that he brings him up in chapter 5. And if you're a Jew and you've read your Bible, and you're a good Jew and you know your Bible, you know who Melchizedek is, or you know the law. You know who Melchizedek is, and you're like, well, why are you talking about Melchizedek? Or you just miss him like we do. I've read Genesis 14 several times and just slide right by him. I've read Hebrews and slide right by him. Right? But he mentions him first, but he can't get in depth as to who he is until he gives us the warning in chapter 6. If you were with us last week, the writer gave us, and Brian did a very good job showing us of the danger of apostasy or the danger of falling away, the danger of getting to a moment of salvation, being enlightened, grab a holding of some truth that I'm a sinner and Jesus died for me and I can go to heaven and I get out of the bad place. 
the danger of getting to that point and stopping and not growing or maturing in our faith. He says, get off the milk, and you've got to get on some solid food. He has to give that warning before this, because chapter 7 is a big, fat, juicy steak, for lack of a better analogy. I mean, there's a lot here. This is not milk. It is some solid food. So he gives that warning when he, after he first mentions him. So I'm going to pray, and there's a lot of information here. I'm going to talk really fast because there's a lot to get through before we get to what it is, the, good, the really, really good stuff. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going we're to dive in. Lord, thank you for this morning. Lord, again, thank you for the opportunity God, uh, to be here. Thank you for, um, for using me personally, Lord, and I just pray that you just open our hearts and our minds to your word this morning and just impart your understanding, Lord, of, 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 of what you want us to know, what you want us to see, Lord, and how to move forward in our faith, Lord. And just uh, be with us in this time, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so bite number one, starting with, chapter, starting with verse one. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Now, the slaughter of the kings, what he's talking about, he's referencing when Melchizedek in Genesis 14 first is mentioned. Now, Abraham, the slaughter of the kings, is Abraham, his nephew, Lot, was taken captive by these kings. So Abraham gets a small contingent of men, goes to battle, slaughters these kings, and rescues his nephew and comes back. And this is where Melchizedek comes in, and that's what he's talking about. So verse 2, And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything, he is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of Man, he continues a priest forever. Verse 4, see how great this man is, or see how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. So, he says a lot there about him. And he's referencing Genesis 14. So if we go to Genesis 14, you get three verses to which he's bringing this out of. Genesis 14, 18 through 20 says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine and blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And then we don't hear anything else about Melchizedek till Psalm 110. That's it. That's all you get is three verses. But there's so much in three verses that the writer here pulls out of that as to who this guy is that he says, see how great this man was. So right there in three verses, he gives three blessings. And it's important to note that the first thing he does when he comes out after the battle, he brings bread and wine. So if the writer's comparing Melchizedek with Jesus, he brings out bread and wine and gives a blessing. If you're Christian in here, I mean, you can scarcely avoid mentioning the association to communion or the Lord's Supper. He brought out bread and wine and gave a blessing. That's one. Go back to verse 1 in Hebrews. The, he's a priest of the Most High God. So how is he a priest? 400 or so, hundreds of years later, when the law comes, the law appoints priests. But prior to that, this is 400 years later. There's no law to appoint a priest, but yet he says that he is a priest of the Most High God. So how would one become a priest of the Most High God if there's no law to appoint him? The Most High God has to be appointing. See how great this man was. Now, that's one of the offices he, that he holds. He holds another office. He's a king. Well, he's a king of righteousness. So if he's a king, we would assume he has a kingdom. And if he has a kingdom, he has people. But if he's a righteous king, he rules righteously. People rise to the level of their leader. He has a righteous people, a righteous kingdom. In addition to that, he's the king of Salem, that is, king of peace. So he's a peaceful king. If people rise to the level of their leader, they're a peaceful people. It doesn't mention that he was in the battle. He came out after the battle. If you're comparing that to Jesus, I'm not, we can't list the scripture that points to Jesus' righteousness and how righteous Jesus was. And one of his names is the Prince of Peace. So you see the connections that are being made here. Also interesting to know that Salem, the city that he was king, king over, is an ancient name for the, for the name of Jerusalem, which is Drew Salem. So Jerusalem, peace, where Jesus, the Prince of Peace, went to make peace between us and God. You see the connections that are being made. He's without father or mother or genealogy. It doesn't mean to say that he does not have a father or did not have a mother. It just, Scripture doesn't give that. He has no genealogy. Every, prom, every other prominent figure in the Old Testament had a genealogy. Was a son of, was a son of, was a son of. You can go from Abraham, there's a genealogy that goes from Abraham all the way to Jesus. But there's no Melchizedek in there. He's having begin, neither beginning of days nor end of life. Doesn't mean that he just showed up, but Scripture just shows up. 
He just comes out of nowhere, goes back into nowhere. But it doesn't mean that he didn't, wasn't born, doesn't mean that he didn't die. But it just, Scripture doesn't give that picture because it's pointing to someone else. But resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. So if you've read ahead, read ahead, and I've had conversations with people where they say that there's commentaries and commentators that say this is a pre-incarnate Jesus in the Old Testament. I'm not saying that it is or isn't. But the writer here says that he resembles the Son of God. Not, he doesn't say that he is. He resembles. But then he says he continues a priest forever, and that is the point that the writer is about to start unfolding. So moving on, verse 5. And those descendants of Levi who receive the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people that is from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man who does not have his descent from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now the descendants of Levi, who is Levi? Levi was one of the 12 sons of Joseph who became the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph being the son of Jacob, being the son of Isaac, being the son of Abraham. So Levi is the great-grandson of the patriarch, the man, Abraham. Right? So he goes on, they go on to be the 12 tribes of Israel, and Moses, under the law, sets the tribe of Levi apart to be priests. And the priesthood in the law set forth, if you ever read Leviticus, it's an exhilarating read. It's really not. There's hundreds of laws, but most pertain to how the priesthood is going to operate. They have to do that. This is how they do everything. They take sacrifices from the people, make a sacrifice on their own behalf before they can make that sacrifice for the people. And above the, high, above the priesthood was the high priest. He was the one man that could go through the veil into the Holy of Holies and make atonement for the people once a year. So you have the high priest, then you have the priesthood. But all of them came from Levi. So that's what he's saying. Those descendants of Levi is who he's talking about. Now in the law, they receive, who receive the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people. That is from their brothers, though these are also ascended from Abraham. But this man, Melchizedek, does not have his descent from them. He's hundreds of years before them. But yet Abraham is paying tithes to him. And what came first? He came out and blessed him, and then tithes were paid. Abraham didn't pay a tithe to get a blessing. He got a blessing, and he was obedient and paid a tithe. And not to mention that, blessings go down, tithes go up. Right. We tithe to the church. The church is the body of Christ. We come underneath the church. Tithes go up. Blessings go down. So verse 7, it is beyond dispute that the inferior Abraham is blessed by the superior Melchizedek. See how great this man was. Verse 8, in the one case tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself who receives tithes paid tithes through Abraham, but he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. In verse 9, I can see the first century Israelite, or the, excuse me, the first century Jew kind of lean back on that. You, one could even say that Levi himself paid tithes. Man, that's a stretch right there, brother. That's a stretch. I don't know about that. But at the same time, we share in Adam's sin because we come from Adam. It's the same thing he's talking about. One could even say, quit struggling with this, one could even say Levi paid tithes. So that was a couple big bites. Are y'all still with me? So are you picking up what I'm putting down? We're, we're still good. Okay. Verses 1 through 10, the writer tells us who Mel Melchizedek was. But in verse 11, he begins to introduce a problem. There's a turn that begins to be made. So verse 11, Now, if, protect, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek? So he says, now if perfection had been attainable, what is implied by that? One, perfection is required, but the word if means that it's not attainable. So the priesthood, there's, he's introducing a problem. There's a problem here. If it's, if it's required, but it's not attainable, we got a problem. So he goes on in verse 12. He says, for when there's a change in the priesthood, there's necessarily a change in the law as well. So now he's introducing a solution. If there's a problem, he's showing there's a solution. What is that solution? There's got to be a change in the priesthood. But if there's a change in the priesthood, there's got to be a change in the law. But that's how this solution is going to be applied. There has to be a change. So verse 11 shows there is a problem. Verse 12 shows there's, there's a solution. Verse 13 says, For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. Now verse 13 is where he starts pointing to the solution. And this is where he makes the shift from Melchizedek to Jesus. He says, For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, 
Melchizedek didn't belong to another tribe. He was way before tribes. So he's talking about somebody different. So verse 14, for it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. Now he names the solution. So verse 11 says there's a problem. Verse 12 shows there's a solution. Verse 13 points to it. Verse 14 names it. And he says, the Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. But he's saying the solution is the Lord, but he's not a Levite. Remember, a Levite is a priest. If you're not a Levite, you're not a priest. He's from Judah. Jesus can't be a priest under the law. So he's the solution, but how is it being implemented? So 15 and 16, tell how, it's, tell how he's the solution. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek. So now the Lord was descended from Judah. He names him. Now he's saying he's arising after the order of Melchizedek, someone different, who has become a, cre a priest. 16, he says, now he has become a priest. The solution has been implemented. But he's a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. What is an indestructible life? Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the grave. The linchpin of our faith. If he did not rise from the grave, from the grave, then our faith is futile. We're a people most to be pitied. Jesus rose from the grave. He is eternal now. He conquered the grave. He has an indestructible life and he goes on. He lives forever. In verse 17 provides a witness to that solution. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, who this witness is makes this change possible. If there's going to be, if there, if there's going to be a change in the priesthood, there has to be a change in the law. But you can't change the law unless you are the lawgiver. So who's the witness? We have to back up because he's quoting Psalm 110, verse 4 again. But if we back up to Psalm 110, verse 1, it's a Psalm of David. And David says, the Lord says to my Lord. In the Hebrew, he says, the Lord Yahweh says to my Lord Adon or Adonai, which means Lord or Master. That's Jesus recognizing someone greater than himself. There's someone between him and Yahweh. And God, through David, says, the Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And in verse 4, he says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Are you, did you catch it? God the Father says to God the Son, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And he says this a thousand years after Melchizedek gets three verses in Scripture detailing who he is. So a thousand years after Melchizedek, you get God through David saying to the Son, you are a priest forever. A thousand years after that, here comes Jesus, becomes the priest, lays down his life, rises again to that indestructible life, and goes on back to the Father. And the writer of Hebrews writes this, explaining this to Jewish believers who are struggling with who Jesus is. Two thousand years after that, we're talking about it today so that we can move forward in our faith and we don't stay where we're at. Amen. Do you see the picture? Do you see the story that played out from way back when? all the way to now. And he continues in verse 18, for on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. So the change has been made. It's been set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. It was weak because it could not cover the entire sin of the people. And it was useless because every day, all day, they had to bring sacrifices. Every day, all day, except on Sunday, they were making sacrifices on their behalf to cover their sin but it could not do it. It was weak and useless. Verse 19 says, For the law made nothing perfect. That, su that statement sums up the problem. The law made nothing perfect. If perfection is required, there is a problem. And the law, the only thing, the reason the law is there is to point to our imperfection, to point to our sin, to point to our need for a Savior. But then he says, But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. So the former commandment was set aside. A change had to be made. The change was made. It was set aside. So on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And if that wasn't enough to get us convinced, to get them convinced of who Jesus really is, he gives verse 20 and he says, It was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. By their birth, they were made a priest. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord is sworn and you will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. He goes back to Psalm 110. Verse 4, in the first part of verse 4, is the Lord has sworn 
We saw in Hebrews 6, verse 18, it is impossible for God to lie. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. The lawgiver changed the law. The Lord has sworn you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 22, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. He's the co-signer of a better covenant. It's not like a contract. There's not parties that sit down and negotiate terms. I want this. I want that. I'm not going to take this without that. It's like a last will and testament. It's this is the will. This is my will. You're either going to accept it or you're going to reject it. But we don't have to do it our own. We have a co-signer on our behalf. Under the old covenant, Moses was the mediator, but there was no one to guarantee the people's side of the agreement. The people were sinful, and they failed under it over and over and over. But in the better new covenant... It depends on the cosigner, not on what we do. We can fall, we will fall, but the cosigner will never. He's the guarantor, he is the surety. So in verse 23, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Verse 25, consequently. If 7 is the focal point of the writer of the epistle here to the Hebrews, 25 is the focal point of 7. Consequently, everything that we've just said, and not just chapter 7, not just the first six chapters of Hebrews, you could go back to the foundations of the earth, everything that was said, the entire priesthood, the sacrificial system, every ounce of blood spilled, leading to and including blood on the cross points right here. Consequently, because of everything that we said, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Did you catch it? The weight of it. He says, he is able to save to the uttermost. The word for uttermost is double meaning. It can mean completely or at all times, but both fit. He is able to save completely at all times those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. There are three implications that we can take from this that are huge. One is who he saves. Who does he save? He He saves those who draw near to God through him. And that drawing near to God is not what he warned against in chapter 6. The reason for chapter 6 before this, it's not a drawing near and stopping. It is a continual, perpetual drawing near to God over and over for the rest of your days, continually drawing near to God and not stopping. And drawing near to God through him. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we draw near to God through, through him. That's who he saves. So second thing is how he saves he saves by his intercession. Romans 8.34 8, says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of the, fall, of, of the hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. So how does he save? He saves by his intercession. Now wait a minute. What, didn't he save us on the cross? Well, yeah. The cross covered it. The cross paid the debt. It covered our past, present, and future sin. But there's present and future sin. We still live here and we're still sinners. And we're still going to sin. The cross covered it. He rose again and he goes on to the Father, but he has to intercede forever. As he said, he always lives to make intercession for him. He's interceding moment by moment on our behalf, on our behalf because we're still sinners in this world. And the third implication is the biggest. If we don't grab a hold of the third implication, nothing else, none of it else, the rest of it doesn't matter. The third implication is what he saves from. Remember verse 19 said the law made nothing perfect. If perfection was required, and nothing, it makes nothing perfect. It just points to our imperfection. It points to our what? Our sin. It points to the sin problem, the one thing that separates us from God. So what does he save us from? Sin is, the pro- sin is a problem, but greater than that sin problem is God's eternal righteous judgment on that sin. So what is he saving us from? If he goes to intercede on our behalf to God, if we draw near to God through him, what is he saving from? He is saving us from God. And I don't mean to say that, God, that Jesus loves us and God doesn't. That's not what I'm saying at all. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the gospel in one, in one verse. God loves us, but the problem is God's eternal righteous judgment against the sin in our life. And Jesus has gone on and intercedes on our behalf, so he solves our greatest problem. And if our greatest problem is solved, what does that say about our current struggles? What does that say about this world? What does that say about every day that we're here? 
If our greatest problem is solved, we still live in this world. It's still a sinful, fallen world. The enemy is still here. Peter says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He is still the thief that comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He is still here. This is still his world, and we live in it. We're, not to, we're told not to live, live in it, but not live of it. But the enemy is here, and he seeks to take every bit of peace that you have, every bit of joy that you have, every bit of happiness that you have. If he can make you miserable, that, miserable, that misery will spill into somebody else and somebody else, and it's a sickness that he just wants to infect the world with. He's still here, and we still live in it. We're still affected by it. But if our greatest problem is solved, what does that say about our current struggles? As much as we're promised blessing and good things, we're, mod- we're not immune to suffering. Matter of fact, as much, if not more, the Christian life, biblically, you're promised suffering. You're promised persecution. You're promised oppression. It is going to happen to you. Peter says, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as if something strange were happening to you. Nothing is new here. There's no sin new. There's nothing that's going to come upon us that is new. Don't be surprised by it, Peter says. It's going to happen. We still live in this world, but don't buy into the lie that if we just believe in Jesus, we come to that point, we just believe in Jesus, we get our get out of hell free card, everything's going to be peaches and cream the rest of our life. That is a lie. People were leaving the church in droves because they bought into that lie, and when life happened and things got bad, they bolted. I can be miserable on my own. I can be miserable without having to be nice to people. Don't buy into that lie. But Paul, Paul encourages us. Good Paul, always encouraging. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, Paul says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The things that are seen are the things that are here that, affect, that afflict us. The things that are seen are just the things that cause pain and suffering, that hurt. Those are the things that are seen, the things that are unseen before. Jesus' intercession moment by moment on our behalf, that is something that is unseen. The things that are seen are transient. They only last for a little while. They're momentary. The word there means it's, they're, they're not permanent. So what are we focusing on, church? Our eternal weight of glory beyond all, prepare, all comparison or our afflictions here? Because he says our afflictions here are light and momentary compared to that. If our greatest problem is solved, what does that mean about what we struggle with here? They're light, momentary afflictions. Now, I'm not saying that we, we shouldn't be affected by the sin in our lives. I mean, we're not, I'm not saying that you can't be affected by other people's sin because it, it does get honest. There is an effect. If this person sin, or sometimes it comes to us and we, it hurts us. I'm not saying that you're not a good Christian if things don't bounce off of you like a ping pong ball. I mean, me personally, in the last, I mean, just a few weeks ago, a little bit longer than that now, but very recently, I, I, I had the most, the worst emotional turmoil I've ever had in my life due to a situation. I didn't think I could feel that bad in the pit of my stomach. I never thought I could have that feeling. It was the worst feeling I ever had. And I didn't respond well. It affected my worship on the stage. It worked, affected my work. It affected my leadership in my journey group. It affected leadership on student ministry. It, fe- it pretty much affected every aspect of my ministry in this building. I didn't respond well. I didn't respond as a good Christian was. It didn't just bounce off of me. It affected me deeply. But I moved past it. I moved on because I, I changed my focus. I took my focus from that, which was here, and I put it on what that is to come, and this didn't, it wasn't that big of a deal anymore. I'm not all, not completely all right, but I'm okay because he's interceding for me. My focus changed. But this world, it's still here. We're still in it. We still experience pain. We still experience suffering. And sometimes in this world, it gets hard. I know it gets hard within person, within my own family. I mean, it gets hard. In the world, sometimes it just seems like it doesn't quit, like a rod over the back. It just beats and beats and beats and beats and beats. And what do we do in our pride and arrogance? We just push back and push back and push back. As hard as we can. As the, further, the more harder it pushes, the harder we push. And it pushes harder and harder and harder until we get tired and we're wore out. And physically, we can't do it. And then just bam. 
We give up. And where are we at? We're in the very place that healing can begin. David said, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise. And when we get here, we got nothing left. We're tired, we're broken, we're beat. No sense of pride, humbled. And we cry out, God, I can't do it anymore. I cannot do it. I can't do it. And our high priest puts out his hand. And he says, my child, I already did. And he lifts us up. He puts us back on our feet. And he doesn't just dust us off and send us back out in the world. He breathes new life into us. He reminds us of the promises. Behold, I'm with you to the end of the age. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I go to prepare a place for you. It's better that I go because the helper's going to come. Oh, yeah, we got the Holy Spirit. It's the same spirit that hovered over the water at creation. It's the same spirit that rose Jesus from the grave. It's the guide. It's the, it's the counselor. When we get to that mountain of affliction and we don't know what to do, if we're drawing near to God, we have the Spirit to say, you go this way, or you can go this way, or he might say, we're going straight through it because there's good on the other side, and you need it. you got to go through here to get to over there. But guess what? It's a light momentary affliction, and I will get you there. You are not alone. Why? Because I'm interceding for you right now. There's an eternal weight of glory awaiting you beyond all comparison, but you got to go through here to get to it. And it's worth it, church. It is so worth it. Writer Hebrews here, he finishes up. Uh, in verse 26, he begins to just kind of summarize everything he said. And he says, uh, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and unstained. Jesus had to come and live amongst us to do what he did. I mean, he was tempted in every way just as we are, but yet he was without sin. He was unstained. It didn't get on him. The sin of others can get on us. It's, it's not surprising that this person over here can make us mad quick. Their sin gets on us. We can watch the news. The sin of the world gets on us sitting in our, room, in our living room. We, we get stained by it. Jesus was unstained by the sin of the world, and he lived in it. That is huge. To be separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those priests to offer sacrifices daily for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Since he did this once and for all, for all, when he offered up himself. He has no need to offer sacrifice on his behalf. When the people brought their sacrifice to the priest, they had to sacrifice for themselves. Jesus was perfect. He didn't have to do that. It makes the sacrifice that much greater. And guess what? We didn't have to bring anything to him in the first place. He's the sacrifice. What do we bring now because of the blessing tides go up? We bring ourselves. As Paul says in Romans 12, make your bodies a living sacrifice. But we do that because of his sacrifice. Verse 28. For the law, of the, for the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has, became, who has been made perfect forever. Chapter 8, verse 1 says, Now the point and what we're saying is this. The point and what we're saying is this. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Everything, everything pointed right to Jesus. A change had to be made. The law had to change. So God himself changed the law, sent Jesus, and he is now at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven interceding on our behalf. So where is our focus? That is the question today, church. Where is our focus? Is it on what is seen or what is unseen? Is it on eternity or is it worldly? What is our focus, church? Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for this morning. Lord, once again, I thank you for everyone that is here, Lord. I pray for each individual heart, Lord, that, that your word would fall heavy on them, Lord, that they not disregard it, Lord, not pass it off, not neglect it, Lord, but they would grab a hold of it, Lord, that it would be, begin to penetrate and seek in and soften that hard heart, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that it would help those that are already soft, Lord, to move forward, to continue, Lord. I pray, Holy Spirit, that your word would just continue to spur us on 
to give us the strength, Lord, that is not ours, but is yours, God. To see the next day, to get through the hard day, the struggles, the things that are coming, Lord, so that one day we can get there to that eternal weight of glory, Lord. There's beyond all comparison. We can stand and bask in your embrace and in your light, Lord, and when all things fade away and glory remains, Lord, that we'll be worthy to stand before you, God. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your son. I thank you for your sacrifice. I thank you for being the perfect high priest. I thank you for continuing to love. It's in your name we pray. Amen.